Right, okay, so listen, thank you very much for um, joining me on this webinar. Um, I, whether it's the, it's, it's the evening in Ireland, it's, it's the afternoon in the States, or, or lunchtime if you're on um, the west coast of the States. Um, thank you very, very much for attending anyway. And I'm, I know some of you know me and, and others of, uh, other people um, haven't attended one of these before with me. So I'm Vivian Campbell and I am a qualified herbalist. And I qualified as a herbalist um, 13 years ago. Uh, I have got some grey hair uh, somewhere in there, <laughs> just to prove that's true. <laughs> and um, I, uh, I did a degree in herbal medicine and it was really just um, because I really, really, really wanted to be a herbalist and it was the only thing I could find um, at that time because back then, I mean really it was 16 years ago when I was looking for, um, thank you very much, we've had another good message about the sound. Um, I, um, uh, when I was looking to study herbal medicine, it was before the days of typing things into Google and getting back pages and pages of answers. So it actually took me over a year to even find um, an organisation that ran a, a herbal medicine course, at which point I wrote to them and said, um, where do you do your courses? I want to do this. I'm prepared to move just about anywhere. So um, that's how long ago it was. So I did a degree and... Um, and I moved, I studied in England. I'm from Scotland. I grew up in Scotland um, originally and I, I trained, uh, I did my herbal medicine training in, in Lancashire in England. And then I moved to Ireland. I have um, a lot of family connections in Ireland and I've always loved it over here. So I moved over to Ireland and I started to work as a herbalist then. And I started my, my clinic from scratch and um, I'm just, um, completely and utterly um, devoted to this work really and I find it absolutely fascinating and um, it, it really is a pleasure to be able to share more and more of it now. There's so much interest in it now. Um, when I started running my clinic years ago, um, people, health was, people were interested in health but they were they were quite interested in buying um, supplements. Um, they weren't so much interested in meeting the plants behind the products, whereas now people are very interested in um, meeting the plants. And I started teaching um, one day classes and workshops on how to make herbal medicines. And I started doing that 12 years ago. And I started with one class a year and um, I've lost count of how many classes a year I do now. I know there was one year I did 17. Um, and um, but I, I really I am I love I love I, I love helping people in the clinic as well. And I don't want to uh, undermine that in any way because it's very special, rewarding work to do with people. But I really, really love teaching because it's introducing people to these plants so that they can do a lot of these things themselves. There are so many basic things that are easy to treat at home when you know how. And I genuinely do believe that it is everybody's birthright to know, to be able to recognise and use some of the plants, the local plants that are medicinal and some of them that are edible. And um, if I had my way, then everybody would have this knowledge and these skills again. Um, it's knowledge and skills that were commonplace um, to our ancestors. Um, a lot of people can be quite afraid of it now. They're afraid of um, doing something wrong, of things interacting, of um, picking the wrong thing and poisoning themselves. And, um, you know, foraging is a real skill and there, there are lots of deadly things growing out there. And to the untrained eye, they can look really, really similar. But, but there are, you know, lots of herbs that are very, very, very easy to identify that don't look similar to poisonous plants. And it's like electricity. We use electricity all the time and it's really, really dangerous. But because we take for granted, actually, just the basic safety instructions and guidelines for using it, um, you know, we don't generally run around our house electrocuting ourselves. So we don't, you know, wash our hands and jam them into the sockets <laughs> when they're covered in water or anything like that because we know the basic safety rules. So if you have 
basic safety rules, then um, it's the same for using um, herbal medicines and 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 foraged um, ingredients. It's um, if you stick to the safety instructions, then you won't go wrong. And um, I I love um, teaching. As I said, I started teaching one day classes twelve years ago. And really, really simple. There's, there's, there isn't anything that we do in my classes where you'll see a bit of equipment and you go, oh, where do I get that from? It's so expensive. It's pots and pans and bowls and jam, jam jars and um, bits and pieces that everybody has knocking around in their kitchen. Um, and um, I deliberately keep it simple because I, I genuinely want people to be able to go off and do these things for themselves. And the lovely thing about having taught for so long is um, I frequently bump into people or get emails from people who have done classes with me years ago and they say, oh, I love the cough syrup that we, that you showed us how to make it's the only thing that works for my children's cough or they love helping me make it or I still make the ointment and um it's um it's really really rewarding so it's um spring and um I um was slightly later logging on than I intended to be because I scuttled out behind my house and picked you a little foraged bouquet of um plants that are out um, already that are um, edible and medicinal. So I will pick out a few of them and see if you know what they are. Um, does anybody recognize this leaf? Uh, if you, you can type it into the chat bar if you're there, if you've just joined us, you can chat, you can type in your answers. You're into the, the bar um, at side here. So we're starting with an easy one. Yay, dandelion, dandelion, dandelion. Very good. So hang on a minute. I'll if I put some paper behind it. It'll be easier for you to see. So dandelion, there are, there are lots of different types, uh, varieties of dandelions. Um, the good news is that they are all edible and medicinal. You don't need to run around trying to work out um, which variety it is. You can just use them all. Um, and um, you, you know, you've, there are other um, plants that, that grow in spring and early summer that have leaves that are a bit like this and flowers that are a bit like a dandelion. But um, you know you've got a dandelion because if you squeeze um, if you squeeze the stem or any bit of it, you'll get the white sap out of the dandelion. And that, incidentally, is very good to get rid of warts um, and verrucas. Somebody's having problem with the video and the sound. Is anybody else finding it's cutting out and skipping? If somebody else could let me know. Um, I've got one report here from somebody that the video is cutting out and the sound. The video is skipping and the sound is cutting out. So if anybody else could let me know if you're having problems, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Um, I will move a bit closer to the microphone. Somebody else as well. Okay, so I'll I'll say is that better? Is that better for people? Okay, it's, it's working brilliantly in America. <laughs> Seems to be having a few internet problems in in Ireland. Seems better now. Okay, I'll lean. I'll lean in. Sorry, I'll 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 lean in. Is that better? Great, thank you. I'm getting I'm getting better messages now. Just I want I wanted to show you things, but I think it was too far back from the microphone. Anyway. Closer to the mic seems better. Okay, thanks. So you're just going to get my big face. <laughs> okay, so um, the dandelion then has got lots and lots of medicinal properties. Um, I'm going to stick to the medicinal things tonight. If you want to learn more about wild food foraging, then I'm going to talk about that um, tomorrow night in tomorrow night's webinar. And if you can't attend it live, just register for it because I can send you around the recording afterwards. But the flower and the um, leaves and the roots of the dandelion are all medicinal, uh, all have medicinal properties. And um, the leaves, you probably have an idea what the leaves are, are um, known for. They are um, an excellent diuretic, so they support um, kidney function. And um, 
the, the common name that tells us this is they're known around the world in various different languages as uh, wet the beds and pissy beds and all sorts of rude names like that. Um, and that's why, because they're a really fantastic um, natural diuretic. Um, very rich in um, uh, vitamin C when they're fresh and uh, lots of minerals too. Uh, the roots, um, the, the leaves are good for the, the liver too. The roots are particularly good for the liver because they're they're very bitter. And so in the in spring and the early summer, uh, April and May, usually you get fresh the fresh dandelion flowers. And the leaves usually, it depends where you live, but they're usually available to harvest fresh all year round, which is fantastic because herbs are plants and plants are seasonal. So um, most plants tend to be available in the spring, summer and autumn. We get very little growing through the winter. So the dandelion is our friend, dandelion leaves, because we can still harvest them during the winter. Um, so that's the dandelion, and um, does anybody know this one? Hang on a minute, I'll get some paper. You might not know the name of this one, but you'll probably recognise it. I will give you a clue. Uh, it's the only one that does that. Ooh. Cleavers, yeah, yeah. So it's one of these sticky ones. Uh, you'll know it. Yeah, that's right, cleavers, or it's got all sorts of other names. Um, Robin, run the hedge. Um, where I grew up in Scotland, we called them sticky willies for some reason. Uh, that was the local name there. Uh, clivers is another one. Uh, Gallium aparine is the Latin name, and it tends to grow down in the shade. Sticky backs and tipperary. Yep, thanks very much. Somebody had the Latin. Very good. <laughs> Very impressed. Um, so you'll know it because it's the one that um, your kids kids throw at each other because it sticks and um, and the cat comes in, uh, the cats and dogs come in covered in it, particularly in um, late summer when it gets the little green seeds, the little green balls and the cats and dogs come into the house and they're covered in these. These are the seeds of cleavers. And cleavers is... Um, really useful tonic herb it's one of um, a group of herbs that we call in herbal medicine lymphatics because they work on the lymph system so that's your glands that are underneath your chin and your your tonsils and running down the sides of your neck and into the armpits the breast tissue is lymph as well and then there are lymph nodes down in the groin so that's the lymphatic system and um, so cleavers can be really helpful for people who are prone to swollen glands and tonsillitis, things like that. It can also, um, the, the lymphatic system is like the nuts and bolts of our immune system. So taking herbs that improve the function of the lymph um, can help to boost immunity if you take them regularly and over time. And the famous um, herbal immune tonic is echinacea, which for our, um, our, our um, listeners in the States, the people who are joining us from the States tonight, is of course, echinacea is in the daisy family and it is native to North America and it is a lymphatic herb, but cleavers is, it's much, um, it, it, it does some it's well it, it has some similar properties it's it's not as um it's not got the same sort of antiseptic um action but it it works on the 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 lymphatic system and uh, so it's far far less well known um but incredibly um incredibly useful herb and grows abundantly so um really really um useful plant um does anybody Speak, actually, speaking of, now this one's beginning. Now this won't be any good if I show you it in the white background. But do you recognise this one? So this is a daisy. This is just a common daisy. And um, yeah, it's a common daisy. I know it's quite hard to see because I did just literally go out and pick these for fresh for our webinar. And um, because the sun's beginning to go down here, the daisy was beginning. The video's frozen. Is anybody else having a problem with the video? Is anybody else having a problem with the video? Uh, you are. Uh, anybody else? Because it seems to be working at my end. It's fine with somebody else. Yeah. 
Um, okay, could you, just let me know, has it come back on? It's frozen with you as well. Right, okay. You can still hear. Hopefully it will come back on again. Um, if, if you could let me know the people, yeah, I can see some people are having an issue and other people aren't. So the people that are having an issue with the video, if you could let me know if it comes back on again. Um, okay, the sound is consistent, so I will keep talking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, the, the this is just a common daisy. So this is Bellis perennis. It's not one of these giant daisies that you get later in the summer. It's the common daisy that I'm talking about, or the lawn daisy. So it um, is the thing um, that we all learnt to make daisy chains from as a child. And um, daisy has all sorts of remarkable properties. And again, I'll talk about it tomorrow night as a food as well as a wild foraged food. But it's an incredible um, medicinal plant. Does anybody use Arnica? Arnica cream? Does anybody use Arnica at home? Have you got that as a first aid? Yes, I'm getting yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so Arnica is, um, oh, very good. Yes, 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 from around the world. <laughs> Arnica, as um, many of you know, is, um, is a herbal remedy that is used to, um, it's applied to bruises and bumps um, to help to, reduce the swelling and, and relieve the pain and help them to heal. So it does tend to be um, a, a sports person or, a, or a, a mother's friend for our children that, that come in with all these bumps and bruises. Um, however, what you possibly don't know is that the Arnica is a type of daisy. It grows in the Swiss Alps. It's native to Switzerland. And um, it really became very well known because Dr. Vogel, of um, who founded BioForce, um, um, made Arnica. He he was he was in Switzerland, and uh, so a lot of the the remedies from his range come from um, Switzerland. And um, BioForce, I think, were one of the first big brands to do Arnica. Um, in fact, I mean, he was the one that popularised Echinacea as well. Dr. Vogel travelled around the world and he's got a fascinating book that is completely and utterly out of print about his travels and treating various different tropical diseases using herbs. Uh, anyway, I'm getting off topic. But um, Daisy, uh, our local native daisy, Bellus perennis, is um, our local equivalent of Arnica. And it's wonderful to treat bumps and bruises and aches and sprains. And it's actually, it's better than, than Arnica because Arnica can't be put onto broken skin, whereas Daisy can. And Daisy actually um, helps to heal the skin. And um, there's even recent scientific evidence showing this. Um, I came across a study last year where um, extracts of daisy were applied to wounds on rats. I always pity the poor mice and rats, but there we are. That's um, how a lot of medical testing is done these days. And um, the wounds were shown to heal more quickly. So um, I, I have here some daisy ointment. Ooh, there we are. Um, that I made last year from daisies and um, this is a really nice um, balm to approve to uh, to approve <laughs> to apply to aches and pains and sprains rather like you would arnica cream but you can make this yourself most people if they have um, a lawn uh, then they have lots and lots of daisies so there are there are a remarkable number of things that you can do with daisies and one of the most useful things you can do is extract them um, to into an oil. We extract uh, plants into an oil. It's called an infused oil or a macerated oil. That's another name for them. And then from that, um, we um, use something to solidify it, to turn it into an ointment. So I tend to use beeswax. You can use cocoa butter and um, other things to solidify it um, if you'd rather not use beeswax. Um, so that's a really, really nice uh, thing that you can do with um, daisies from your garden. There, there really are, they have such remarkable um, medicinal properties as well. Um, and they're so, they're, they're available so abundantly. 
and um, I really love to look at the plants that literally are growing under, I was going to say under your nose, but under your feet, <laughs> if I'm going to be literal. Um, because even when you study a herbal medicine course, it does seem to be, it's quite an odd hybrid of um, plants that were taught. There's There are things that grow in mainland Europe and things that grow in America. And there tend to be a lot of just local common plants that have fallen out of use. And um, it's... Um, it's lovely. I started to research local plants. I, I live on the edge of a national park, so I'm actually really spoiled where I live. I've got, I've got the most fascinating things growing on my doorstep, um, alpine flowers and orchids that are really popular popular in, and used widely in the Middle East actually grow um, where I live. So it's, it's a really interesting place to um, study plants if you're a botanist or a herbalist. Um, so um, it's it really is um, fascinating to look at um, the plants that are around us because so they go through fashions and um, as it well to give the example of of um, Alfred Vogel he did popularise um, several plants like echinacea and arnica and because these become the extracts that are for sale in shops these are the things that articles are written about and are mentioned in books over and over and over again and so more local um plants um were forgotten as people go for products they follow products in shops so whereas really herbal medicine Every country in the world um, has a tradition of herbal medicine. It's the oldest and most widely practiced form of medicine in the world. And um, even in Western society, where it's very pharmaceutical based um, now in conventional medicine, that's really changing. Some of the best drugs that we have in modern medicine come from plants anyway. Um, digitalis is... Um, a fantastic drug for um, treating people who have heart failure and that comes from foxglove and that came directly from a herbal remedy it was a professor at oxford who was dying from heart failure and he attended a local herbalist who gave him a mixture of herbs and he went off he recovered and then went off and analyzed it in his lab and decided that um foxglove was the thing um the active ingredient that um saved his life so um digitalis then entered into um modern medicine um aspirin um comes it's it comes from um salicylic acid which is present in many 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 plants it was originally isolated in meadowsweet because um the old people used to take meadowsweet for to treat to ease aches and pains and in the late 1800s researchers were saying oh I wonder why I wonder why they do this and they were looking at the plants that people were using and when they analyzed meadowsweet they found um, salicylic acid and when they patented the drug aspirin they actually named it after meadowsweet um, the latin name for meadowsweet now is philopendula ulmaria but back um, in the late Victorian age, the Latin name for meadowsweet was Asperia. So when they patented um, the drug aspirin, they named it um, after meadowsweet. And of course, it's since been found in willow and um, wintergreen and all sorts of other things. And it's so cheap to produce. So um, it's another wonderful drug um, that comes from, a uh, useful drug that comes from plants. And it's really, they're, they're having quite a renaissance now. Um, you know, it, when I started teaching um, herbal medicine, it was still seen as quite a fringe thing um, where, and quite a, an alternative thing or old wife's tales. And it's really changing now. And um, as is evident by the amount of medical studies that are being done at universities uh, uh, and research centres all over the world looking at native plants that have been used and um it's um it's really fascinating and and you know sometimes you get people who are really skeptical and they say oh surely herbs can't possibly work it's a load of nonsense and to which I usually reply well no pharmaceutical companies have got their plants and their factories in um in um the rainforest it's they're they're there because they're looking at the plants they're not there for the weather you know um plants are just these powerhouses full of chemicals and how they 
work on their own or react and, and interact with, with the ingredients within themselves and within us as just lifetimes of study. And if we had um, graduates and researchers studying all of this, then we wouldn't have an unemployed graduate ever again because there's just lifetimes of work and it. it's infinitely fascinating. And uh, pharmaceutical companies are looking at this stuff and um, universities are looking at it and um, it's great to see um, so much interest in it but there's so much that you can do at home for yourself that is free <laughs> or very very cheap to do and um, you know pharmaceutical companies are researching it they're looking at it to produce <laughs> a product that probably won't be very cheap by the time it gets to the consumer so it's wonderful to be able to recognize the plants that are around you that are medicinal and have some of the basic skills for making them yourself i've had a question here if you want you can ask me questions if you want you just need to type them into the chat bar um from from daisies do you only use the flowers or the leaves also i use the flowers um i'm not sure if you can use the leaves as well i need to double check that i always use the flowers um, when I am using them either as a food or as a medicinal extract. Um, so we'll see what else we have here in our pot. Uh, I have got this now. I'm showing you how tough I am now doing this because anybody recognise this one? Ooh. Yeah, nettle. So um, so nettle has got lots and lots and lots. This is a stinging nettle which um, grows in, in most parts of the world, but doesn't grow in certain parts of the States, I've been assured. So if anybody's in the States and doesn't have stinging nettle, this is our kind of hazardous equivalent when you're out walking and you, you've got, you guys have got to watch out for poison ivy. We have to watch out for nettles because they sting. <laughs> but if you take nettles over time, if you take them regularly, they are a natural antihistamine. And what they do as you take them is... Um, they tend to make the body less and less reactive so that then when you come into contact with whatever allergen it is that's setting off your allergy, your body tends to be less reactive so you get less of an allergy. The allergy tends to be less severe and it happens less frequently. And um, just to prove that it really does work, I drink lots and lots of nettles and it makes you, if you drink lots and lots of nettles then over time they don't sting you as much so I went out and picked up with my bare hands and I'm holding it now and it's not stinging me I'm not wearing gloves I'm not cheating <laughs> I just do drink lots and lots of nettles so um nettles are um yeah I'm getting a question here about cooking them and yeah so I will um I'll talk tomorrow night more about the edible side of nettles um and and how you use them as a food but it's in terms as a as a medicine wear gloves when you go out and pick them don't you you'll be there for ages trying to pick them and not not stinging yourself so do wear gloves uh, unless you want your hands to be tingling for the rest of your rest of the day so just pick them and wash them and put them the simplest thing to do is to make um tea and all you need to do is put them into a pot pour on boiled water and let them stand for sort of 10 minutes and um, strain them off and drink them you can leave them to stand for longer if you want to have it stronger and the longer it infuses for the more um, nourishing it is basically um, you have to make infusions or teas up fresh every day because there isn't any preservatives so don't let them don't drink them if they've been there for more than 24 hours you can also dry them and use them as tea so um, I have um, I have some herbs here that I dried last year these are literally mm, I don't know if you can see those see I've had to move in so close now because of the video but um there we no no i don't think i can get that at the right angle for you hang on i'll put them in my hand right so here i've got some here i've got some daisies that i dried so i did these last year and um you can dry any herb whether it's nettles or it's flowers or it's roots or it's barks or it's berries you can dry them and the reason we dry herbs is to preserve them so that we have can you hold it still yeah sorry and um, so the reason there that's the dried daisies 
So the reason that we dry herbs is so that we have them available when the fresh plants have died back. So um, the spring is a great time to go and harvest the nettles because they're they're young and fresh. Um, and um, these are daisies, as I said, that I dried last year and, and I still had some left, left from last May when I did them. Um, so you can make tea from the fresh herbs or the dried herbs. Um, and that's the, that's the nicest way to take nettle, I think. Well, you can cook them as well, as I said. I'll come over to, um, I'll come on to culinary recipes tomorrow night. Um, but um, I think the fresh nettle tea is beautiful. And when I do a, a workshop or a class, I always try, I, I do some mystery herbal teas and I get people to try and guess what they think they are or just give me their impressions of the of the flavor and what they think and I quite often um I always try to do nettle as long as they're fresh because um they taste so remarkably nice when they're fresh they've got a very different flavor when they're dried they're very savory they're almost more soupy when you make uh, the tea or the infusion from the dried herbs but when they're fresh they're lovely and refreshing and almost lemony and um, they really are remarkably nice and they're very, very energizing. So um, I love to use fresh nettles. Um, yes, I'm getting some questions here about nettles. Yes, they are also like um, dandelions. Nettles are also very, very good to support kidney function. You'll, you'll hear a lot about things being, de de you know, doing detoxes and things being detoxifying. And it's a term that gets bandied about um, a lot. <laughs> And a lot of the time it's pretty meaningless. But in terms of dandelion and nettles, it is true because dandelions and nettles support kidney function. And your kidneys are a giant filter in your in your body, filtering uh, waste. So, it, so when you take a tonic that supports kidney function, it's helping this sorting system for getting rid of waste it's helping it to work more efficiently so because it's supporting the way that the body excretes waste they are detoxifying um nettles um yeah i mean i'm being asked are they good for the liver um dandelions tend to work more directly on the liver because they're bitter any herb that tastes bitter is good for the um supports liver function because when you taste something bitter it stimulates um the bitter taste buds on your tongue and it triggers off a whole chain reaction in the body it causes the liver to produce bile it causes the gallbladder to release bile it it gets your stomach acid going and it causes the pancreas to um, release digestive enzymes and um that's why bitter aperitifs, um, bitter aperitifs are, are made from, sorry, aperitif drinks that you take to stimulate your appetite tend to be made from bitter herbs. And um, a good example, culinary example of using them is if you've ever been for tapas for Spanish food, at the beginning of your meal, you're presented with a dish of olives because they're bitter and they stimulate your appetite. And, um, you know, we, 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 we might have forgotten to include bitters in our diet now. We used to get them from lots of different salads that contained leaves, like, like dandelion leaves that were bitter. Um, but we still know that we don't start, excuse me, we don't start our dinner by eating a load of chocolate truffles because, we, you know, if you start with something sweet, you feel full up and you're not going to eat other things. So bitters have the opposite effect. Um, yeah, and um, you, spring is the easiest time to harvest um, fresh nettles, but you can get them much later in the season as well. You'll, you'll see, oh, you know, only collect them in spring. That's not true. As long as you collect them when they're fresh and green, then they are fine. When, the, when they start to flower or go to seed, they're too old. And if the stem's gone really dark, it goes a sort of purple colour. Leave them if they've gone dark or if they've gone, if they've started flowering or gone to seed, because they do actually then develop a chemical which we think is possibly harmful for the kidneys. So don't use old nettles, but you can get them fresh much, much later in the year. If you look underneath um, bushes and trees down in the shade, you can still usually find fresh nettles even at, into the first week of September. Or if you're like me and you're completely mad and you actually cultivate your nettle patch, 
then all you need to do is go out there and strim it or or use um, clippers and cl- cut it back and it, they'll regrow and you'll get another crop or two of nettles. So use them when they're fresh. They are good. I'm being asked, are nettles good for the blood? Do they contain iron and vitamin C? Yes, 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 they do. Um, they are, a tr- you know, again, in traditional medicine, they're traditionally taken as a tonic for the blood. And before anybody had any concept of um, vitamins and minerals, vit- I mean, vitamins in particular are a remarkably recent um, recent um, concept uh, in diet. We sort of take, you're welcome. <laughs> we, we sort of take... Um, take it for granted all this vitamin stuff and recommended daily amounts and things but they are a remarkably recent concept some of them really were only um developed in the 1950s the idea of vitamins but anyway long before people knew anything about minerals or vitamins they knew that nettles were good for the blood and now that we know you know we're a bit more au fait with the chemistry of them we know that they contain iron and of course iron enriches the blood and helps to prevent anemia developing so yes they are very very good for the blood and because they support the kidneys they've got this great cleansing function and lots of herbs are rich in vitamin c when they're fresh daisies actually contain nearly as much when they're fresh they contain nearly as much vitamin c as lemons Yet, you know, we all think we need to import citrus fruits. I mean, citrus fruits are great for the flavour. <laughs> but um, daisies um, t- daisies are remarkably high in vitamin C when they're fresh. Vitamin C starts to evaporate, basically, as soon as you pick things. So um, fresh dandelion leaves are very rich in vitamin C too. Um, I'm being asked a few other questions about nettles. Um what do I think about putting them in smoothies? Um, well, the blade, the blade would chuck them up. I don't. If, as long as you've got a really good blade, then um, that's pulverizing them, then you shouldn't end up with a stung mouth. I do have a story about a stung mouth. I'll tell you that tomorrow night because it's a food one. <laughs> but um, I would just say to you, I know juicing and smoothies are really, really popular just now. Um, don't think that because a herb is edible, it's juiceable. Because juices are very, very, very concentrated extracts. And some herbs were traditionally juiced. And they were, but it was little, it was teaspoon dosages or thimble dosages that, that people were taking. It wasn't these great big beakers of things. Everybody seems to go for massive amounts of really concentrated stuff now. So there are some herbs that can be juiced, but it's tiny amounts of juice that you take. And there are some that you just shouldn't juice at all because you'll end up with an extract that's dangerous, basically. So I do mention these now when I teach because it comes up more and more because lots and lots of people are juicing. And, um, you know, our cultivated foods have come from wild foods like um, lettuce, for example, uh, originally came from wild lettuce and um, cultivated lettuces um, aren't sedative, but the wild lettuce is sedative. And as, as it's been, you know, as different types of lettuce have been bred to be, you know, juicier leaves and, you know, bigger leaves and things as as an edible crop, we've got more and more away from the wild properties of the herbs. So be cautious of of wild um, herbs because um, of using them in large amounts, because um, unless I tell you it's okay to do that, which which I will do, uh, I always do give dosages and things in classes. Um, But... um, Wild plants are much have have much higher concentrations of chemicals that have just sort of been bred out really or, or bred to really really low levels in cultivated crops. But to 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 go back to the lettuce again, I mean, if anybody read the Beatrix Potter books when they were a child, I don't I can't remember which one is it. The Tale of Benjamin Bunny, and the rabbits go into Farmer McGregor's garden and they gorge on the lettuces and they fall asleep because lettuces are a sedative and they get caught and he puts them underneath a flower pot and. There's a big rescue, it's all very exciting. <laughs> but that's um, lettuces were still known when Beatrix Potter was writing as as well known as being soporific. Um, Peter Rabbit, yeah, yeah, it is. Peter Rabbit's in it, but Benjamin Bunny is his cousin. I think it's the tale of Benjamin Bunny. 
But anyway, <laughs> I'll need to need to dish it, um, feel like Beatrix Potter again. Um, what do I? Sorry, I've just oh, hang on a minute. Let me see if I can. Right. What do I think of mixing herbs for tea? Are they still working as well, or could they contradict each other? That is an excellent question. Thank you. Um, this question comes up a lot because in our modern society, we are used to pharmaceutical drugs. And when you take one, you've got to watch that it doesn't interact with another and another and another. And drug interactions are a big problem and they're dangerous and you need to be really, really vigilant. Herbal medicine, herbs are much, 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 much closer to food than they are to drugs. Pharmaceutical drugs are usually one chemical or possibly two co extracted and concentrated and then mixed with fillers to turn them into tablets or whatever. But essentially you're taking a very concentrated extract of, of one chemical. Whereas herbs contain hundreds of chemicals, say on average there's 300 chemicals in, in a herb. Um, so side effects from herbs are, are, are very, very rare. And they're, they're usually very, very mild. Um, because there are hundreds of chemicals and they're, they're, they're working with each other and balancing each other out. And to come back to the example of meadowsweet, which I gave you earlier on, which is the plant that aspirin was originally isolated from, um, one of the problems with taking aspirin regularly, it's given to thin the blood. It's, it's not a problem if you take it occasionally, usually, but it's given to thin the blood. And one of the problems of taking it regularly is it can erode the lining, damage the lining of the stomach and the gut, and it can cause bleeding and people can start to bleed from their bowel. And that's not from an overdose, that's from taking it at the correct dosage. Whereas meadowsweet in herbal medicine, it's actually used to protect the gut. So d despite the fact there's salicylic acid in there, there are all these other chemicals and they are balancing it all out. You're very welcome. I'm getting, sorry, I'm getting... The loveliest message is going up and down the side of the screen here. You are very, very welcome. I love sharing this stuff. I genuinely do want everybody to know this. So anyway, um, so to come back to the question, which is, can you blend herbs? Are they going to contradict each other? No, they're not like drugs. Um, you, you don't run this risk of interactions and side effects and calamities and hemorrhaging and all of this stuff. Um, herbs are much, much closer to food. And it's like if you um, were cooking bolognese, you wouldn't say, oh, I'm just going to use parsley. Um, you would say, oh, I'm going to put in some basil, some garlic, some oregano, some parsley, some thyme, some bay leaves, and you, you end up with a better blend. And it can be very, very good to blend herbs um, because it can it can actually enhance their effects. So um, so it's safe to, to blend herbs and um, it's, it's lovely. You know, they tend to work better even sometimes when they're blended. Um, so, um, so I've been getting lots and lots of questions and I've got loads more herbs here, but as you can see, I can talk about, I could talk about herbs until midnight. Um, I've already gone on for much longer than I promised. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show you a few other bits and pieces and then I better sign off. But, um, I, um, I teach classes in Ireland, but for those of you who aren't, and I have, my, my website is theherbalhub.com for any of you that, um, don't know it it's uh, I'll take it into the bar here it's the herbal hub let's see if I can type and talk at the same time there we are and um I teach classes in Ireland and take foraging walks here but I have an online course as well and I have students all over the world and um I launched my online course in May last year and um they follow the plants that are in season and I have videos um, helping you to identify plants like these. There's primrose and uh, all sorts of other things in here, sorrel, that we didn't get to um, today, uh, this evening in the talk. But um, I have videos showing you how to identify the plants. And then I have videos and photos showing you how to make extracts from them. I've got, um, I'm, I'm actually updating the e-courses just now and the new improved version of my e-courses will go live um a week on friday so that is um the 20 uh, 22nd friday the 22nd of april the new version will be there i have just re-uploaded 100 videos <laughs> i filmed over 100 videos last year and i've got some new ones that i want to add in this year too so um 
the e-courses cover herbs that are edible. You're very welcome. The the e-courses cover herbs that are edible and medicinal. They're, they're common herbs that are easy to recognize. And I show you how to use them as a food or a medicine. There are safety instructions. There are tips and guidelines for finding herbs if you live in a town or a city as well. You don't need to live in a country paradise. And um, here are behind me are some of the beautiful extracts that we've made last year. That's a tincture of um, nettle roots. That's from the, o the autumn one. And um, if you are interested in the e-courses, then I'm having a special offer where if you buy them in the next 48 hours, you'll get 20% off them. And I will um, email you the link and the details of that after the um, webinar and um, I, um, I'll, so I'll send you the, the code for that too um, and then you'll get, you'll get, if you do enroll in it in the next 48 hours as I said you'll get 20% off and um, we'll email, we'll send you your login details then on the 24th of April and the course will start the following week. And also, if you, if you enroll just now as well, I am going to have, um, one of the new features for the e-courses this year is I'm going to have special guest experts with me. Last year, I did the whole thing by myself and it's a supported course. I'm here to answer your questions and help you. We've got... Um, a private Facebook group and uh, we have webinars during the courses as well where you can ask questions so we do much longer versions of what we've done this evening um, but I'm going to have special guest experts and um, and uh, we're going to um, have little special bonus features on really nerdy foraging things actually it's going to be great I'm really really excited about it and the first one of those will be uh, during the last week of April as well. So I will um, email you those details. Um, I'm just getting so many lovely messages, thank you. I uh, can't quite keep up with them all now, um, but you are very, very, very welcome. And um, I, oh, I'm being asked, is there a tester lesson? Is there a sample lesson? There, do you know, there isn't a tester lesson, but there is a seven day money back guarantee. So if you buy them and then we send you the login details from when you get the login details, which would be the 24th. If you want to look at the e-courses and if you don't, if you don't like them, we'll refund your money. There's a seven day money back guarantee. Um, no one has ever taken me up on that <laughs> so far. <laughs> but you might get someone who just can't listen to the accent. So, you know. No, it's only fair. <laughs> uh, somebody is saying the course is so worth it. It is. There is no test or needed. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so listen, you are very welcome. Uh, thanks for joining me. And if you want to, you love my Scottish accent. Well, thanks very much. I'm stuck with it <laughs> at this stage, I think. Um, uh, I'm going to do a food foraging one tomorrow night. So I'll be talking about similar plants because I, I want to show you the things that are in season just now. I've got behind me sitting on the shelf are some of the extracts that we made on the e-course e last year. So I've got rosehip vinegar, a cough syrup made from honeysuckle, which is absolutely divine. We did that on the high summer course, which is in July and August. It's just heavenly. Got various different ointments like the daisy ointment, plantain, self heal. And um, there's St John's wort oil. There's rose oil. There's all sorts of beautiful things that we made. And tomorrow night I will do something similar, but focus on the edible and nutritional qualities of the plants. So if you want to join me tomorrow night, just register for that webinar too, and I will be sending round the recordings too. So listen, thank you very very much for um, joining me. I really appreciate you giving me your time. And um, hopefully see you again soon. Okay, nighty night. <laughs> or good afternoon to those of you in the States. <laughs>